All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're going to start off here with Chumash today on uh, February, Sunday, February 20th. I'm filling in for Rabbi Bukit. We're starting a new Parsha, Parshas Vayakel. Um, it's also a new chapter. We're in chapter Lamed Hay, the 35th chapter. Let's get right into it. Vayakel Moshe. As call Adas Pnei Yisrael vayemer aleim eladvar mashar tziva Hashem laasei saisam. Moshe gathered the whole community of the children of Israel. He said to them, "These are the things that Hashem commanded to make." When was this day? Rashi says, "This was the day after Yom Kippur." He came, this is when he came down from the mountain. And he came down right after Yom Kippur, and this is when he told the Jewish people, commanded them of what they should build. Verse number two. Six days you can do work. On the seventh day you must rest. This is Shabbos. And whoever performs work on that day shall be put to death. So Rashi right away says, one second, what is it? we're talking about the Mishkan. What does it have to do with Shabbos? So Moshe talks about the details of the Mishkan. He warns on the Shabbos to show that there's a connection. In general, you know that the Malachis that we're not allowed to do, the actions that we're not allowed to do, on Shabbos is because you weren't allowed to do them. Um, you weren't allowed to do them. The Mishkan doesn't supersede Shabbos. And that's how we know what is considered a malacha, what is considered work. We know it from what was done in the Mishkan, because that is what you weren't allowed to do on Shabbos. Pasuk number Three, you shall not kindle fire in any of your dwelling places on the Shabbos. Rashi says, some of our rabbis say that, that the prohibition of kindling was singled out for a, a negative commandment, while others say that it was singled out to separate all kinds of labor. Interesting. And Moshe spoke to the entire community of the children of Israel, saying, this is the word that Hashem commanded to you, saying, um, Rashi says, for me to say to you, take for yourself an offering to Hashem. Every generous-hearted person shall bring it a strumas Hashem zav kesef nuchayshas. Gold, silver, and copper. Um, Pasuk number six. And blue, purple, and crimson wool, and linen, and goat here. In ram's skin. Um, dyed red. And acacia wood. And oil for lighting. Upsamim and spices, l'shem and amishcha for the anointed oil, l'kteres hasamim and for the incense, the avne shoyam and shoham stones, the avne miluim, um, le'efed of the chayshen and filling stones for the efed and the chayshen. Those had stones in them, so Moshe is telling them all the different things that they need to bring for the mishkan. V'chol chacham leiv and every uh. Smart person, they shall come and make everything that Hashem commanded. So everyone donated not just of their um, physical things, like everyone donated not just their physical things, like all the different things that was just listed, gold, silver, spices, oil, you know, skins, uh, like animal skins, uh, blue, purple, and crimson oil, wool, um, Besides for all of that, people also gave of their skills. As a mishkan, as a halay, the mishkan, its tent, ves michsehu, and its cover, ves krasa, ves krasha, ves bricha, ves admuda, ves adonav, its clasps, its clamps, its bars, its pillow, pillars, 
and its sockets. Um, let's see what Rashi. Oh, let's do Rashi on its tent. That is the tent made of the curtains of goat here, made for a roof. Vesnichseyu and its cover, the cover of ram skin and tachash skins. Let's continue. Esa orain, the orain, the ark, the esbadov, its poles, the eskakapiras, the esparechas hamasach, the ark cover and screening and and screening divide curtain. So what is let's let's see what Rashi here says on the divide curtain. Parechas hamasach, the dividing curtain, which serves as a screen. Anything that protects, whether from above or from the front, is called a screen or a cover. Similarly, you made a hedge about him. Behold, I will close off your way. So interesting. So a parechas, a curtain, is is called anytime, whether it's above or in front, so it will be called a parechas. As hashulchan ve'asbadav as kol kelav, the table and its poles and all the 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 kelav, all the all the vessels that's lechem upon him and the showbread. Ve'as minoras hamar and the menorah and that for lighting. Ve'as kelav. And all of its vessels, ves and its and its lamps, ves shem and hamar, and oil for lighting. Um, what were the kela? What were the vessels of the menorah? You might be like, what, what, what does a menorah have vessels? Maybe we said earlier about, uh, you know, the the table. But what does it have to do with the menorah? So it says, its tongs and its scoops. Let's look at this Rashi, the oil for lighting. That too required wise-hearted people because it was different from other oils. You had to know how to do the oil for the, for the Menorah. As explained in Menachos, he picks it, the olives at the top of the olive, olive tree, and it is crushed and pure. So there was some sort of chachma, there was some sort of knowledge in knowing how to um, prepare the Menorah the oil for the menorah. So that's why they also needed, you know, knowledgeable people for that as well. All right, let's continue. Number 15, Pasuk number 15, that's Mizbeach Haktoras, and the Mizbeach Haktoras, the altar for incense, Ves Badov, its poles, Ves Shemen Hamishcha, and the anointing oil, Ves Kteras Hasamim, and the um the, the incense, Ves Masach HaPesach, the Pesach HaMishkan, um, and the screen of entrance for the entrance of the Mishkan. Where was the, the screen in front? It was on the eastern side because there was no planks or curtains there. Okay, number 16, as Mizbeach Ha'oila, then you have the, you have two Mizbeachs, right? You have the Mizbeach Ha'ktores, the, the altar for incense, and then you have the altar for burnt offerings. There's Michbar Nechishas, it's copper grading, Asher Loi, as Min Nechishas Asher Loi, as Badav, as Kol Kelav, as Akiar, as Akanoi. Um, its poles, and uh, then we had the, the wash stand and its base. Number 17, the hangings of the courtyard, its pillars, its sockets, and the screen to the gate to the courtyard. Um, yeah, let's look at Rashi, the screen of the gate of the courtyard. What does Rashi say? Let me get. Oh. Okay, someone was trying to get in. Okay, what does Rashi say about the uh, screen that was on the gate of the courtyard? The screen spread out on the eastern side, covering the middle 20 cubits of the width of the courtyard. For it, the courtyard was 50 cubits wide, and 15 cubits of it towards the northern side were closed off, and similarly towards the south. Okay, so it was 50 total. And then 15 on each side, which leaves you with 20. So that's what we're talking about, the middle 20 cubits. That's where the stuff were. Okay. Es yisdois hamishkan, 
the pegs of the Mishkan, and the pegs of the courtyard, and their ropes. What were the pegs? The pegs used to drive into the ground and tie to the ends of the curtains with them into the ground so that they, the curtains would not move with the wind. So that's how they kept this Mishkan from, from stay, like kind of like a tent staying in place. Um, let's go to Pasuk number 19. There's big day hasarad, the meshwork of garments, the stories hakaidish bakaidish as big day hakaidish la aron hakayin, as big day one of la kayin. Um, the the garments of the aron hakayin and the garments of the sons and the garments of all the kayanim. By yitzu kol adas pnei yisrael mufnei Moshe and the entire community departed from before Moshe to go do everything that Moshe just commanded. So, in this week's chita uh, starting chumash. We so far learned everything that um, uh, Hash- M- Moshe commanded the Jewish people from what Hashem commanded him to tell the Jewish people about the Mishkan, of how to build the Mishkan, and what is needed for the Mishkan. And the Yidin went with great gusto to go uh, complete those tasks. Let us look at Titania for today. Okay, we were talking about how even a cow, we're, we're, okay, let's, we're in Lakutia Amarim, in the middle of Lamed, uh, chapter 30, and uh, we're talking about how even a cow Shabakalim, even every person, even somebody, the lowest of the of, of, of person may, may be, he needs to fight his evil impulse. Otherwise, there's no difference between you and, and there's, if, 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 if someone is not able to change his nature, change his impulses, then I guess one can ask what makes them different than an animal. So we're going to go right into this. Anyone who has not attained this standard of waging, waging a strenuous war against his body, like we said earlier, not just a little bit, going a little bit above what you are capable of. Like, in other words, imagine you, you're, what would be comfortable to learn every day is X amount of time, and you do a little bit more. That's not enough to really change your nature and really beat out the evil impulse. So a dying, if you're, if you're not going to, you know, if you're not going to wage a strenuous war, then a dying lo yegil v'chinas ve'erech milchames ha'yetzer, ha'boyer ke'esh lahava. Then you're not going to measure up to the quality of the war waged daily within the Kal Shabakalam against the evil in, a, in nature, which we said before is, is like a fiery flame. So that the, the evil impulse will be humbled and broken um, before Hashem. So, like that's this note says, this then is the standard by which everyone must judge himself. Does he battle against this evil impulse? Not during prayer and, and also in other times of service, as intensely as the Kalshma column must battle against his. Are we measuring up at the very least to the Kalshma column, to the, you know, the lightest, the, the, the person who is waging this war, the lowest among us? And the same two. Um, is when one, one is making brachis, which brachis is all about kavana. It's all about having, you know, actually having thought on what you are saying and what you are think, um, um, thinking about when you're saying the grace after meals or when you're making any other type of bracha for, before performing a mitzvah. The ainsar chlemer kavanase ha mitzvah lishman. And not to mention what is your intention when you're doing a mitzvah, that it should be for the actual sake of the mitzvah, but not for any ulterior motive. And the same thing is when one is studying Torah. To learn more than what is your desire. Like according to your nature, you must struggle to do really gulasai and you, what is you're accustomed to. You have to do more than that. 
to, to wage this war against your body. Let's read this note. When one studies Torah only as much as his natural inclination or habitu habituated diligence dictates, it requires no effort or struggle at all. But in order to match the struggle of the Kal Shabbat must one must study far, far more than he would by nature or habit, as the Alter Rebbe continues. Because <laughs> somebody who just learns a little bit more than his nature would entail. This is a small war. And it has no comparison to the, to the fight of his evil impulse, which burns like a fire. The Mikra, Rosh Hagamar, Im Einim in Atzech Yitzray. If if you're not going to be able to um, um, uh, overcome Min Atzech, if you're not going to be able to win over your your Yitzer, your your uh, impulse, then. You're a, it's you call the Rosh Gummer in quotations. Leo is Nichnov and Nishpam and Hashem. If he does not conquer his impulse so that it can be subdued and crushed before Hashem. Let's read the note. Similarly, unless one struggles with his even evil impulse to study much more than his nature or habit demands, he is no less wicked than the Kal Shabakalim. But one may object to this reasoning. How one may say, can I, in all honesty, compare my shortcomings to those of a Kal Shabbat I'm lack, I am lacking merrily in the quality of the good that I'm doing, while he actually and actively violates prohibitions enumerated in the Torah. So the Alter Rebbe asks a question, or Bavarins, he pre-answers pre a question that one might have. How can we say that just by the fact that I'm not overcoming my nature, I'm now like the Kal Shabakalib, I'm a Russia Gummer. What do you mean that person is doing actual bad? Going against actual um, commandments of the Torah. And I'm and how could that be compared to me? I'm just not overcoming my nature. At least to the extent that 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 is needed in order to, uh, like it says, in order to Mohammed Sayyids or to overcome the evil, which is which is burning like a fire. So I'm just not doing that. But I'm, how can I be compared to a Kal Shabakalim? So Alter Rebbe says, What is there um, between the category of Sormeira, turning away from evil, which the Kal Shabakalim um, is, is fails at um, and the cat uh, and compared to the category of do good, which he also fails at. So there's two categories, right? There's surmeira and asetoy. Surmeira means um, um, going go turning away from doing bad, and asetoy is doing good. So let's read this note to see the differences. To be sure, there are differences between the ca two categories. Each has its own unique spiritual effects its own specific intentions. But these differences pertain only to the person performing the mitzvah. The essential point in the mitzvah, however, is that it is an expression of the will of the, only, of the one and only, uh, the only and unique God. And in this, there is no difference whatsoever between these two categories, as the Alter Rebbe continues. Okay, so what are you saying? You're the, the, you're, the person is trying to argue that I'm different because I, that person, it, the Kal the Shabbat is failing at Sor Meira. He's failing at even turning away from evil. And I'm only failing at Asay Tov. But to Hashem, who's commanding both of those things, and it's an expression of Hashem's will, those are the same in that aspect, in, from that perspective. Hakoli mitzvah, I'm continuing over here in the Tanya, Hakoli mitzvah, Hamelach HaKadosh. It's all command, Yachidum Yuchad Baruch Hu. It's all a commandment of the Holy King, the one and unique, the only and unique one, blessed is he. So the failings to absorb, to, to observe mitzvahs is comparable to the transgressions of the Kalash Vakalam. Mechim B'Shar Mitzvah, B'Frat B'Davar Shavimamayim. And the same too is with other commandments regarding one struggle. One may find that he may he does not wage war adequately against his evil impulse, especially in matters involving money, 
like in the service of charity, um, get, doing charity in a way that's actual labor, you know, more than the amount that someone is comfortable with. Um, these are areas where people have a, you know, it's natural to have a hard time to overcome one's natural tendencies and one's natural inclinations. And what the Altar Rebbe says from Hashem's perspective, from the perspective of the will of Hashem, the Sur Meira and Asik Tahiv are equal. They're both Hashem's will, whether it is staying away from doing bad or doing good. We have to be able to do those things more than our nature, not like the Alter Rebbe said, not even a little bit more, because a little bit more is not enough to win the war. In, uh, if doing a little bit, you have to go way above one's nature and way above one's um, inclination to do. Thank you so much for joining me today in the Tanya and Chomesh, today's Chitas. Um, I believe Rabbi Bukit will be back tomorrow at eight o'clock to learn with you all. Thank you. You're welcome.